as we commemorate. Sorry, I was just interrupted by a little voice um, saying recording in progress. Um, Bishop Jonathan, kind of through the example of Teresa of Avila, um, kind of reminding us, giving us some insights into the place of religious life and that gift to the church. Um, Bishop Jonathan is our bishop visitor, and this is a sort of a special um, feature of a religious community. And as the Society of the Holy Trinity, we are an acknowledged community, therefore we have a bishop visitor, and his role is a, on a very practical level, to um, oversee our place in, in the wider Church of England in relation to our practices and safeguarding. And he sort of wider, what I just be, uh, described, has a role to support us in being faithful to our vocation as new monastics. So he has the sort of bigger oversight where we fit into the wider church. Um, it can get confusing because we all need to interact and engage quite actively, practically with our local bishops. And, and that is a, a kind of a role supporting us in our mission and where we are. So, so I hope it's not too confusing that we have a bishop visitor and we are delighted that Bishop Jonathan is with us um, and he has long experience of new monasticism in the church. So I now hand over to you, Bishop Jonathan. Thank you, Jutta. It's really good to be with you all. Um, lovely to see you. And uh, yeah, to share a few thoughts today um, around um, renewal of the church um, and particularly the role of new monasticism in that and with a focus on today's Saint Teresa of Avila, who um, is someone who I've been interested in for a long time and it's lovely to have the chance to, to reflect um, on her a little bit. Um, mostly people today um, reflect on uh, Teresa's spiritual writings um, and some of you may have read them, some of you may have not, but um, actually what I'm going to be talking about um, is the other thing that she spent her life doing when she wasn't um, holed away in writing um, and I think that's a really powerful example and inspiration for the church today. Uh, and I hope particularly for those of you who are part of this society. So that's um, that's what I'm going to be doing today. Um, just a thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I could talk at length about my, my various experiences and background, but um, maybe another time would be good for that rather than um, taking up this particular um, time. But um, just to say that I do take seriously my role as visitor, um, and I'm hoping that um, in due course, and I've been talking with you about this, uh, that I will in fact do some visiting, um, because it would be really good to be able to have some sense of what the life of the different communities is like, um, and to be able to work out how I can support and enable and encourage you um, along the way. Now, Teresa. <clears throat> Teresa, um, entered a Carmelite convent at the age of 21. Um, that wasn't so much so unusual in those days. Um, and she was there for quite a long time, just living you know, in the life of a, of a nun. She came from a really rich family. It was a, you know, it was a respectable middle-class vocation for a, for a woman who didn't uh, wish to be or didn't get married. Um, but then in her, in her 40s, um, she began to experience a renewal of her spiritual life. Um, and that led her to propose a renewal of the whole tradition uh, of which she was part. Um, as often happens with religious traditions, um, over time, the uh, initial enthusiasm of the um, Carmelite prayer tradition, which had begun in the Holy Land on Mount Carmel, um, with people who are trying to engage with that sort of sense of immediacy of God that we have from uh, Elijah's time, you know, prayers on Mount Carmel, um, had rather sort of ebbed away and the rule had become more, more relaxed. Um, and she was part of a renewal movement that was going on um, across the religious traditions at that time. 
1562, um, in the teeth of quite a lot of opposition from within her order, um, she managed to establish the first house of her reformed version of the Carmelites um, in the town of Avila. Um, after a few years of just enjoying the life there, she embarked on the foundation of more new communities, um, including those for men, uh, working with her rather more famous disciple, St John of the Cross. It's interesting that um, it took a, a long time for it to be realised that actually St John of the Cross was a follower of Teresa rather than the other way round. But it was then that the fun really began. Um, the new version of Carmelite life was, was a not very subtle critique um, of those who were already members of the community and who found the existing rule quite sufficiently demanding. Um, and once it looked like this new way of religious life might actually catch on, the opposition grew quickly. So in the convent where she began her religious life, um, nuns who later voted for, for Teresa to be their next prioress were excommunicated. That's quite serious, really. Um, John of the Cross was imprisoned by monks of his order and kept in atrocious conditions for months until he finally managed to escape. The renewal of the church is never easy. And although it's usually a little more subtle nowadays, uh, those who challenge the institution are always an unwelcome disturbance to some, um, often to most, uh, and particularly when they offer a critique to the rest of the church. But that is an integral part of any renewal of the church. If everything was perfect, there wouldn't be anything to renew. So skipping on to the present day, renewal, of course, has had quite a lot of currency in the Church of England lately as a word. Um, I discovered by looking at the Church of England's website, because you probably wouldn't know otherwise, um, that the uh, re renewal and reform programme does still continue to exist, um, though its profile has somewhat diminished. Um, and I don't want to be too negative about attempts by the church to reform and renew itself. Um, it is, after all, a sign that the need for both of those has been recognised and that business as usual is only a recipe for continuing decline. But, and it's a big but, I'm pretty sure that renewal of the church can't happen from the centre, or at least that doesn't seem to have been God's way with the church so far. Looking not just at Teresa and at John, but across the story of renewal in the church, there are some common factors which do seem to repeat on a regular basis when a movement for renewal is profound, is long lasting, and we hope inspired by God's Holy Spirit. So three of these. First, it comes from the margins. When the institution is focused elsewhere, in the places that are not of great interest, among the people who aren't the obvious leaders, that's where God sets the seeds for renewal. Like weeds in the institutional garden, renewal happens in the places that no one's paying attention to. Whether it be the Carmelites or the Franciscans or the Methodists or the Pentecostal revival, it always comes as a surprise. Secondly, and this is one of the reasons it doesn't get noticed initially, renewal doesn't fit the dominant ideology for what success should look like, which is sort of inevitable when you think about it. One of the greatest problems for the church as an institution is that it is an institution and it can't stop being one without dissolving entirely. But all institutions inevitably accommodate themselves to the language, practices and expectations of the society of which they're part. So if you're a church in feudal times, you expect all the power and initiative to lie with the spiritual kings and their nobles, that would be bishops. And if society is a bit more parliamentary, then you expect synods and their committees to be where, you, where change will happen. And now in a more managerial or entrepreneurial mode, it's people with money and ideas, the capitalists of the kingdom of God, who are expected to leave a change. And then thirdly, and this is one of the things that most gets up the noses of the institution, 
movements for renewal aren't trying to solve the institution's problems. They're not very interested in the challenges the church institution is facing or how it might survive them. It's not that they're against the institution, it's just that that's not what their focus is. Teresa and John got into such trouble partly because the church authorities were nervous of heretical movements like those nasty Protestants in Germany, which was gathering all of that, which was gathering pace across Europe. They wanted greater discipline, more explicit affirmation of Catholic doctrine, not communities who are pressing beyond words into contemplative mysticism. So renewal finally doesn't go and do the things the institution wants. The church may know where it wants to put its resources. Renewal movements don't happen where the church knows they should. Renewal is unstrategic, unplanned, decentralized and out of control. So to sum it up, Renewal movements in the church consist of the wrong people doing the wrong things in the wrong places, at least as far as the existing institution is concerned. Um, Teresa knew that she wasn't going to be popular, as she put it in her own account of her life. I was well aware that there was ample trouble in store for me, but as the thing was now done, I cared very little about that. Now that is what I see and also hope for in the renewal of the religious life in the church today, of which this society is a part. It's precisely in the contingent and the fragile and marginal life of many of our communities that I see the resurgence within the church of its own deepest vocation, which is to be as much as possible an expression of the love for the world shown in Jesus Christ. Jesus came proclaiming that the kingdom of God was near. At the same time, all that he did and the way that he lived was a continual critique of what anyone might think those words would mean. This is a kingdom with no borders, which anyone can enter who wishes and in which no one is forced to stay. It is a kingdom in which the greatest power is shown in the most sacrificial service. It's a kingdom which renounces coercion. And that cannot be said loud enough or often enough because it's so difficult to hear, but it's one of the clearest messages we read in the gospels. This is a kingdom which pays no attention to conventional views on righteousness and deserving. If it has a hierarchy, it most certainly isn't composed of priests or bishops. The widow who contributes her two pennies the tax collector whose prayer is a pure lament at his own real sinfulness, these are the great in Jesus' kingdom. The church is a revolutionary organisation, but it isn't a revolution which deposes one ruling class in order to elevate another. It's about getting rid of ruling classes altogether. The one obligation all disciples of Jesus have is to love one another as Jesus loved us. One of the things I love about the philosopher and theologian John Di Caputo is that he opens up ways of thinking about this paradox of faith. And there are also quite a lot of things I don't love about him, by the way. Um, in uh, The Weakness of God, um, he waxes very lyrical about the nature of the unkingdom of God to take one paragraph very nearly at random. Suppose the sense of the word God is to interrupt and disrupt, to confound, contradict and confront the established human order, the human all too human way and sway of doing business, the authority of man over man and over women, animals and the earth itself, human possessiveness and domination, to pose in short the contradiction of the world. Suppose God has no time for hierarchical power structures that human beings impose on one another. Not in order to throw us to the wolves of lawlessness, but in order to let the lamb lie down with the wolf. Not in order to level institutions and structures, but precisely in order to open them up, to keep them just, to let justice reign. 
And the event of God does this not by countering power with power, but by opening up the call into the future, which is the divine force without power, as Caputo calls it, the weak force of the gospel. Quoting him again, the kingdom calls. A call is as weak as a word, as a breath of air, a trace or a sigh, while the world is as tall as a mountain. Thus, in the kingdom of God, weak will-of-the-wisp words move mountains. So, the institutional church is inevitable. We cannot live together over any length of time without organisations, but they need to be continually deconstructed if they're not to become themselves the raison d'etre of their own existence. They start to live only in order to keep on existing, not for any other purpose. Within the economy of the church as a whole, the little communities of which you are part are essential to that deconstruction and destabilization, which prevents the church as a whole from departing entirely from its calling. That's an intoxicating and impossible ideal, um, both the desire of our hearts and at the same time an unbearable burden. How can you possibly live the sort of life I've just been describing in this mundane world we inhabit day by day? Well, we can't. At this point, we need to return with a bump to Teresa, who had a marvellous way of undercutting the pretentiousness of spiritual discourse, even while recording quite extraordinary visions. She said of herself, Blessed are you, Lord, who has made me so incompetent and unprofitable. Which might seem like conventional piety, perhaps, but not, I think, when you reflect on another comment which demonstrates real self-knowledge as well as a sense of humour. I only wish I could write with both hands so as not to forget one thing while I'm saying another. She particularly disliked, disliked pretentiousness, um, even in her commentary on the Song of Songs uh, creeps a, a delightfully shrewd description of the lady whose self-importance was so intimately mingled with her devoutness. And Teresa puts it, she and others like her were saints in their own opinion, but when I got to know them, they frightened me more than all the sinners I've ever met. And finally, there's that wonderful little heartfelt prayer of Teresa, which I'm sure we've all prayed. From foolish devotions, may God deliver us. So though we may, in our small and fragile ways, be bringing Jesus' message anew to the church, we mustn't get messianic pretensions. We all live this life of discipleship as forgiven failures, always being picked up again by the God who never gives up on us. So maybe it would be best if you were to forget everything I've just said, because it's likely to distract you perhaps from the day-to-day -day living out of the life of discipleship in your communities and places. The calling you have for the church is one that can only be fulfilled if you don't think about it too much. It's a goal you can only attain by forgetting about it. One more quotation from Caputo. The kingdom is a way of living, not in eternity, but in time. A way of living without why. Living for the day like the lilies of the field, figures of weak forces as opposed to mastering and programming time, calculating the future, containing and managing risk. Some years ago, I was visiting some new religious communities on the west coast of the USA and Canada. And the colleague I was with would always ask, what is your mission? And it was illuminating and amusing to see that they had no answer because for them, the question did not make any sense. Those communities, which were in many cases growing, had no plan for growth, no plan for their continued existence. What they were doing now was the thing that God had called them to do, and that was all. And that is what I'd really like to leave with you. Recognizing that you're part of what God has always done with the church, a tradition that goes back almost to its very beginning, Knowing that your calling is not likely to fit comfortably with the institution, as it never has previously. Well aware that it's ridiculous to expect anything so grand of the individuals and communities that you are, sinful and small and fallible, and that is exactly the way God does it. Knowing all these things, then put them to the back of your mind 
and get on with the day job of discipleship. It's in doing the small things that the great things happen. Thank you. Jonathan, I found that incredibly helpful, incredibly illuminating and very supportive of exactly where I'm at, and everyone else. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, Pleasure. What I'm going to suggest we do is we're going to, in a few minutes, uh, Ian's going to put us into small groups uh, to have some reflection on, on what uh, Jonathan's shared with us uh, from your own experience in your own communities. Uh, to ask where are the resonances? Where are the things that should connect you with you? Where are the things that uh, perhaps challenge you and you want to get some clarification? Um, we're going to have about 15 minutes for this. And can I ask you at the beginning to choose one person in the group um, who's going to feed back to the wider group? Uh, and when we come back to the, together as a plenary, uh, we'll, ask, we'll go around the groups in turn and that person will just give about a quick bit of feedback. And then we'll open it up. For, I hope you go with us all morning, Jonathan, that we'll open it up for questions and conversation with yourself at that point. That's... Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. That's great. That's wonderful. Do um, you want to be in a group just to ask? Um, I think probably not because that I might sort of queer the pitch for the for the group. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll go away and have a coffee and uh, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll uh, just wait for you to all reappear. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, talk about coffee at about 10.45. Um, Ian will send out one of those um, little messages which says one minute and there'll be a little quick countdown. At the end of that countdown is a time to go and put the kettle on. Uh, and go and grab a cup of coffee and we'll reconvene about 10.55 ish um, I mean, we're not slaves to time but around 10.55 ish uh, we'll reconvene together for that plenary session uh, with a nice warm cup of coffee together so um, Ian if you're ready to set, press go um, you'll be asked to join a group in a minute if you can just say yes on the little white box that appears in front of you Oh, this being recorded. No, 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 no. Let me turn that off. Sorry. Um, uh, stop.